Sure. Brother, may I have the title of the sermon? Yes, you will, brother. <laughs> the title, indeed, of my sermon is Co-Perception, the Heart of Liberty of Conscience. Co-Perception, the Heart of Liberty of Conscience. So that's it's a mouthful. Let's see if we can see through the scriptures what I'm talking about here, and especially this idea of co-perception and how it relates to liberty of conscience. We've had some studies in the past uh, year or so where we've looked very closely at this idea of liberty of conscience and how it lies at the heart of the last crisis that this world is going to face over worship. And without true liberty of conscience, we cannot choose to worship God in spirit and in truth. And the Lord God jealously guards our liberty of conscience, therefore, and our free will choice. And we'd like to see from the scriptures and understand better why it is that God places such a high estimation on this issue of liberty of conscience. And we've seen how the world is moving and pressing in to restrict liberty of conscience in a very systematic and global fashion. And we've seen also how there have been elements within the church that have also joined with a similar spirit in lording it over their brother or sister. This is a very important issue, and we need the Spirit of the Lord to understand. Let's have one more word of prayer quickly. Gracious Heavenly Father, our most holy Creator God, we thank you so much for your blessed Sabbath day that is just upon us, Lord. Help us to find rest for our souls with thee. As we open your word, we can not do anything or understand anything without thee, O oh Lord. So we first acknowledge that we are weak and erring and broken sinners and that we desperately need a savior. Wash us clean in the blood of the lamb that nothing might separate between thee and us. We ask that you might surround and protect us with your holy angels and place a hedge about us and that you might fill our minds with your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, to be with the questions and the conversation and the comments that may arise and to transform us from within and to soften our stony hearts that we might take this truth to heart and be changed as our prayer. May it be in Jesus' name, amen. So I thought we'd start in 1 Timothy 1 verse 5. 1 Timothy 1 and we'll start at verse 5. Where the scripture tells us, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Uh, here we have this word conscience here in the middle of this verse. And we see here there is an adjective that is modifying or describing this word conscience, and it's the word good. Of course, if there's something that can be used to describe the conscience as a good conscience, then obviously there is a conscience that is not good at the same time. And we're going to have to see how can we distinguish between the two clearly. 
Now it's very interesting here. It tells us the end of the commandment. Is this talking about the commandments coming to an end? And of course, no, that's not what it's telling us. The word end here in the word in the Greek is the word telos. And we see it can mean end, of, yes, or custom, or atomos, or finally, or ending, the termination, the limit at which a thing ceases to be, the last in any succession or series, that by which a thing is finished, the end to which all things relate, the aim, the purpose. Or here we see properly the point aimed at as a limit or the goal. So the aim or the purpose or the goal that's being pointed to by the commandment. So the law of God, the commandment, is pointing to something. It's an end, it's the goal, it's the objective, it's the purpose. And the end of that commandment is charity, which is the old English word for love, specifically agape love, which is where we get the idea of completely unselfish or selfless love that can only come from God. So the purpose of the commandment is unselfish love out of a pure heart. How can we have unselfish love out of a pure heart? So this word pure is the word katharos, where we get the word cathartic in English. It indeed means pure or clean or clear. Specifically, it means purified by fire. So here's a purifying process that's going to happen by fire. By the way, didn't Jesus tell us that we would be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire? It says here, in a similitude like a vine cleansed by pruning and so fitted to bear fruit. So here's a purity that isn't just natural in and of itself. It requires a purification process to attain this purity. And that involves a cleansing and a pruning for the purpose of bearing fruit. Interesting, clean that, the use of which is not forbidden in a Levitical sense. It imparts no uncleanness. It's free from corrupt desire, from sin or guilt. It's free from every admixture of what is false. So therefore, being sincere and genuine, blameless and innocent, unstained with the guilt of anything. That's the kind of purity God wants us to have in our hearts through the receiving of his love. That's what the commandments are pointing to, that he wants us to have. And of course, the heart here, cardia, why we have the word cardio or cardiology here in English is indeed the word heart. And it is, while it means the organ that's in the center of our body that uh, is in charge of the circulation of the blood, by the way, there's no life in the flesh without the blood. It also can mean the soul or the mind as the fountain and seat of the thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, and endeavors. The understanding, the faculty and seat of intelligence, the will and the character. The central or inmost part of anything, the heart of the matter. So the inmost part of us in our will, our choices and in our character, in our mind and our thoughts and in our feelings, God wants this absolute purity that comes by purifying us through a process of a fiery trials and pruning, cutting back of that which is 
superfluous and unnecessary and a, actually a hindrance to bearing fruit. This is the end or the purpose or the aim or the goal of the commandments from the law of love. And it's also and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So we're going to come back to the conscience here, but we're going to look at this faith unfeigned as well. Faith is the word pistis in Greek. It indeed means faith or assurance or belief, the conviction of the truth of anything. In the New Testament, a conviction or belief respecting man's relationship to God and divine things, generally with the included idea of trust and holy fervor, born of faith and joined with it, the conviction that God exists and is the creator and ruler of all things, the provider and bestower of eternal salvation through Christ, a strong and welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom, Belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence in God and Christ, springing from faith in the same. It also has the idea of fidelity or faithfulness, the character of one who can be relied upon. Beautiful. So this is our faith. God wants our faith to be unfeigned, he said. Unfeigned here has the meaning of without hypocrisy or sincere or undisguised, without dissimulation. So we have a pure heart, pure thoughts and feelings from a that we receive from God through fiery trials and pruning while having a faith, a trust and confidence in God that's sincere and without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy meaning pretending to be something that it's not. This is true faith. That's also the end of the commandment. And a good, as we saw, a good conscience. And that's, we want to get to this idea of conscience. That's at the heart of liberty of conscience conscience is the consciousness of anything it's the word sunidas sunidas in the greek it's the distinguishing between what is morally good and bad prompting to do the former and shun the latter commending one and condemning the other but here, very interestingly, it's true heart meaning that where these other meanings really come out of is it actually means, the very word sinitis means co-perception. And specifically, especially morally. A moral co-perception. We see here also under the Strongs here, it literally means joint knowledge co-perception or joint knowledge co-perception with whom then is the question the idea that i have a conscience on my own is an inaccurate idea biblically our conscience is always my thoughts in my mind connected with the mind of another If I have a good conscience, I'm co-perceiving everything that I'm seeing and experiencing in life together with God, the one who is good. I have a joint knowledge together with God of the way things really are. Well, if I have an evil conscience or seared conscience, as we'll see, then my co-perception is that my thoughts are not in harmony and connected directly with God's thoughts. My thoughts are in harmony with the evil one, with Satan. 
with the mindset of rebellion. And many people who have such an evil conscience don't have any perception that they're actually having a co-perception experience. They think they're coming up with these thoughts all on their own. Or we think this, but it's not so. There is a, another mind, a spirit that is moving on our minds to give us a perception that's in harmony with the perception of the adversary. So we're either perceiving and understanding and seeing things the way God sees them, with a co-perception together with God, or the way Satan sees them in his mindset of rebellion against God and his law. His law of love, specifically, is what he's in rebellion against. And it involves a joint knowledge. And this knowledge is an intimate knowledge, a knowledge of the one with whom you're having this joint co-perception. Either you know God or you know the enemy. And this is an intimate knowledge, like Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore a son. Uh, this co-perception is leading to the, a, either a new birth in Christ, a, through an intimate union, a holy union, that's pure and undefiled and unfamed. Or my mind is being corrupted by the seeds of rebellion being planted through a co-perception that I have. That's my thoughts in harmony with the thoughts of the enemy. And all of us are afflicted with this mindset of rebellion by nature. We have to choose to perceive things differently. We need to choose to be open to God's Spirit convicting us, to allowing God to show us the way things really are. The reality that's so real you actually can't see it. But it's more real than the reality that you can see reality of salvation in Jesus Christ. So let's see if we can understand this co-perception idea better as we go through the scriptures here this evening. So the end of the commandment is unselfish love out of a pure heart and of a good co-perception with God and of faith without hypocrisy from which some have swerved, having turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane for murderers and fa of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So here we have a bit of a list of what is the opposite the, of a good conscience, what is the evil conscience look like, the evil co-perception involves vanity, puffing oneself up, pride. It involves being lawless, disobedient, ungodly, unholy, profane, a murderer, filled with hate, an, a whoremonger, one who is unfaithful, does not have fidelity. defiling oneself, being dishonest, being a liar, bearing false witness, 
know, in any way that's contrary to God's beautiful law of love. That's the evil conscience. That's an evil co-perception. There's one who had all of those thoughts and feelings before you. And that's Satan and the evil angels. And they are constantly seeking to diffuse their perception of reality into our minds to give us an evil conscience. But God and his spirit are striving to draw us with loving kindness that we might have a good conscience out of a pure heart of unselfish love and sincere faith according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. And I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me in the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. See, Paul received grace. He was a blasphemer and a persecutor who hauled people off to jail and tortured and killed them in the name of God. And yet he obtained mercy and grace that led to exceeding abundant faith and love. That's the perception of God. God sees us the way we really are. God's perception doesn't mask the way we really are. We'll see ourselves as blasphemers and persecutors and injurious and the chief of sinners. When we see ourselves that way, putting ourselves below everybody else, then we're having the mind of Christ. We have a co-perception with God that does not puff up in vanity and pride. Uh, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Christ Jesus might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The mind of Christ, the co-perception of God with God, a good conscience will lead one to be merciful because we see how clearly we have obtained mercy that we did not deserve ourselves. And we will show that mercy to others with long suffering patience, following the pattern, the pattern that Christ himself showed and the pattern that here Paul also showed in his life of faith. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever, amen. It's about having a co-perception with God will lead us to recognize Christ as king who rules over me, who has dominion, and I'm under his dominion in every way. And recognize that he's the only wise one in the universe, and he's God. And I'm not God, and I'm not wise. And to him be honor and glory forever and ever. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Here he points him back to the basis of his faith, and his good conscience comes from the word of God, from the, the prophetic word of God, even the spirit of prophecy. There we can have a co-perception with God of what is real and what is not. And that we might war a war, uh, a good warfare. This is not a warfare with others. This is a warfare most particularly with self. We saw that 
It was to the end of the commandment, the purpose of the commandment was to have unselfish love in a pure heart. So our war is against this selfishness in our hearts. And we need this co-perception that God, that comes from God's prophetic word in order to fight that battle. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith, having made shipwreck. So we have to hold fast to our faith and hold on and not let go like Jacob wrestling with God. As God starts showing ourselves the way we really are, we start having the mind of Christ and we have a co-perception. God opens our mind to where we can see the way he sees. That's co-perception. And when we see things the way they really are, and we see him the way he really is, then I'll see myself the way I really am and realize how greatly out of harmony I am from the way he is. And then I need to be strengthened. I need to hold fast to God until he bless me. Because I realize I have nothing of myself. Here is this great battle, and we will each go through it like Jacob alone. So we saw in Genesis 32 that God left him alone in this battle of wrestling with this co perception. As we, God wants, God can completely inhabit our entire minds. He knows everything that's going on in our minds, He knows every thought and every feeling and how they came about, and how to deal with them. But we have to let him in, and to allow him to let us see them the way he sees our thoughts and feelings, so that he can deal with them. And it's not a pretty picture, but he promises to fix it. That's why when we see him the way he really is, that's the first angel's message. And when we see ourselves the way we really are in contrast that's the second angel's message we're fallen and when then we are brought to a time of a judgment and a test and a choice that's the third angel's message and then of course he promises the power of his spirit that's the fourth angel that brings the process to completion and maturity in the midst of the pattern of seven So if we think about this idea of a conscience, and now we're thinking about the idea of liberty of conscience. That's our message, is the heart of the liberty of conscience. We saw the heart of the liberty of conscience right here in verse 5 in 1 Timothy. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. There's the heart of liberty of conscience. It's a pure heart that is in in harmony that has a joint knowledge together with God. And God is not going to allow anyone to take that away from you. No one can take away your liberty of conscience. And anybody who attempts to take away your liberty of conscience is fighting a battle not with you, they're fighting a battle with God. Because God's purpose, the end, of his commands is that we might have this pure heart of liberty of conscience in us. A good conscience of faith unfeigned. In the book of Amos, chapter 3, the scripture tells us, can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed. God wants us to walk together. God wants us to come into agreement with him, to see that his ways are so much higher than our ways, and that we need to come into harmony with his way of thinking, his way of perceiving by his spirit, his Holy 
spirit. Now, what's interesting, this word agreed in the Hebrew means to meet together or assemble at an appointed time. Very interesting. To betroth or to make an engagement for marriage. And it also means to meet at a stated time or to summon to trial. Very interesting. So you're being summoned to a trial at a specific fixed point in time. But it's also an actual an engagement to be married, to be so joined together, the divinity combined with humanity, where the union happens in our mind. With a, through a co-perception where God takes all of our wrong perceptions and he shows us how wrong they are by pointing us to the right perception seen in the perfect pattern of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a marriage proposal. It's the marriage of the Lamb that leads to the bride making herself ready and putting on the white garments, the righteousness of Christ through this co-perception of conscience. Now, it's interesting, and we'll talk about it more at the end. Is there not a prophecy that we preach about as Seventh-day Adventists that talks about a time that's set for us to be brought before God in the trial of judgment. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Well, that this hour of his judgment that is come is this being agreed. God expects that we can walk together with him. How can we walk together? Unless we're agreed on where we're going, where we're headed, and how we're going to get there. That's this, how him and his father are one, Christ told us. This is what Christ wants for us, that we might be one as they are one, where we have a co-perception, a joint knowledge of what is truth and reality. And it leads to a perfect holy union. That's permanent. It's a marriage that can't be, can't be undone. That, that in, in the, the Eastern mindset, when you got engaged to be married, that, that was it. You, you couldn't just break off the engagement. You actually had to get divorced if you had become engaged. It was a permanent commitment to get engaged, to be married. And that's what God is asking us to do here. Very interesting how it talks about the roaring of the lion and the blowing of the trumpet here, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and tie into our beautiful studies that we've had recently on uh, the seals in Revelation. Now, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, to study out this idea a little bit more. And let's start at verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Here's the one mind, the co-perception that God that is the end. Finally, here it says, just like it was the end of the commandment. Here's where God is bringing us to. He wants us to all be of this one mind, this co-perception with God. And it involves compassion one of another, love as brethren, being pitiful, being courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. 
So blessing those who are cursing you is actually a blessing for you and not just for them. Because you're coming into a co-perception of God of the right way of dealing with this issue of selfishness and sin. In myself first, and then I can properly relate with others. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Here is the good conscience that God wants us to have. The liberty of conscience. To choose the good. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord of God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Here, having a good conscience, verse 16. Being willing and ready to suffer for righteousness sake. This is a co-perception with God. God himself, Christ showed us he was willing to suffer for what was right and for having done what was right, not for having done what was wrong. We've all suffered for doing wrong. Here, God wants a change of mind where we're willing to suffer for even for doing for what's right and not having the spirit of fear, but having a total trust in faith in God, in his character of love. And sanctifying the Lord God in your hearts. That's how we can have a pure heart that has a co-perception with God, that we're setting aside our thoughts and our feelings for God. That then we can be a proper witness to others because I'm seeing things the way God sees things. The spirit of prophecy. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed uh, that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Good conversation. Conversation there means the way you live your life, not just your words, but your actions. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. You see, Christ willingly suffered for us, the just for the unjust, so we ought to be willing to suffer for others who are still slaves to their sin. And we see that slavery in verse 19, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. This is not some souls being tormented in eternal hell. These are the living people whose minds are in a prison of a co-perception with the spirit of rebellion from Satan. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, the antitupos, the antitype, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, it's not just the putting away of that which is wrong. God wants more than us to just stop doing what's wrong. He wants us to respond to him, to his love for us, by having a good conscience 
by coming into a co-perception with the way God sees things. His law of love and life and liberty. Coming back into harmony with the mind of Christ. This is the purpose of the death of self and the resurrection to new life. Symbolized by baptism. Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Beautiful. Amen. See, the mind of Christ, the co-perception that we need to see is that Christ is the one who we are subject to. Only when we have a mindset of sub total subjection to Christ can we have a co-perception with God. And in any way that we're not in complete subjection to God, we are not in a good conscience or co-perception with him. And we can't exercise our freedom, our liberty to choose our freedom of conscience properly until we first choose to place ourselves willingly in subjection like Christ did, who found himself in the form of a man and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself even unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, in 1 Timothy 3, verse 9, speaking about the qualifications of deacons, so first talking about elders, and then it, here it just translate, transitions to deacons in verse 8, and then in verse 9, one of the criteria for a faithful deacon is to holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. The mystery of the faith is this willingness to sacrifice self that others might come into harmony with a correct co-perception of who God is. That's the mystery. The mystery was that Christ was willing to come and suffer and die for the enemy, for the rebels, for the ones who were in outright rebellion against his supremacy and dominion and government. For murderers and loving them enough to give up self completely. This is the mystery of the faith. It's mysterious thinking. It's a mysterious way to think about things, to perceive things, because it's from coming from the mind of God, which is so much higher than our thoughts. And this is the co perception that God wants us to have. It's actually a, re a requirement to be in this position of service in the church with a pure conscience, a, a co-perception that's been purified through the trials by fire and by the pruning process to cleanse that we might bear fruit. An interesting example as well we find in scripture is where we see the solution here as well beautifully the problem and the solution is in john chapter 8 the story of the woman caught in adultery is brought before him and we'll pick it up at verse 6 this they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him but jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. And when he continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, 
went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Here is the co-perception that God wants us to have. The conscience. Here, these when it says here that these ones, these accusers, these false accusers, really, hypocritical accusers, because they were convicted by their own conscience. That's really, we see that in the King James here, their own is in italics because it's actually not in the original Greek. It just says being convicted by conscience. See, if they were going by their own conscience, by their own, co their own co perception, they never would have been convicted. The co perception of these pharisaical accusers of the brethren, that's Satan's job, by the way, not anybody who's in harmony with God and the church. But here were church members that were accusing other church members. And they had the mindset of accusation, even though they themselves were guilty. And their, their co-perception was in perfect harmony with Satan. They had the mindset of rebellion against the law of love. But in this moment, as Christ was writing with his finger, was God's writing with his finger, just like he wrote his law on the tables of stone, his law of love, on tables of stone, one table about love to God, the other table about love to our fellow man. And just like he judged Babylon by pronouncing judgment, by writing with his finger, here he writes in their sins in the sand, in the ground, in the dirt. Interesting that we were made from the dust of the ground, and that's where he's writing with his finger the list of their guilty sins. And they're convicted by coming into a co-perception with Christ the way Christ sees them. Divinity is flashing through humanity here, and God is giving them a view of themselves and the way God really sees them. And that was the conviction that led them to leave them alone and stop their accusations and go home. They came to have a co-perception with Christ, at least for a moment, that brought their murderous rage and plans to naught. And we see the woman herself, she came to have a co-perception with Christ as well, when he told her, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. The one who is really in harmony with the mind of Christ will not have a message of condemnation, will not have a mindset of condemnation and accusation, but will not also be one who will simply tolerate sin unchecked and unrebuked. Here the message is, go and sin no more. Not it's okay to continue in sin because I don't condemn you. But come into a correct co-perception with me, a joint knowledge of right and wrong, and choose the right, and stop choosing the wrong. That's but why we need liberty of conscience so we can make the right choice. Here Paul explains it beautifully in Acts 24, verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Here's the definition, as it were, of a good conscience, and a good co-perception with God will be void of offense 
toward God and towards man. That's first table of stone, second table of stone. Void of offense. No sin. No transgression. Because I'm coming into a correct co-perception with God. And I'm choosing the right. As he empowers me to make that right choice in the place of the wrong choice. Okay, let's tie it together here with the book of Hebrews, chapters uh, at least 9 and 10, and then we'll, we'll bring it home. So in Hebrews chapter 9, Paul is making a contrast between the Old and the New Covenant, or the Old and the New Testament, covenant and testament being the same thing, and the... the System in types and shadows, and the system in antitype in Christ. And he speaks of the sanctuary and the tabernacle, and the earthly tabernacle, and the furniture in the tabernacle, and in the first compartment, and in the second compartment, the Holy of Holies. You've got the table of showbread and the candlestick, and the the altar of incense and the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant with the two tables of stone with the law of love, Aaron's rod that budded, and over it the mercy seat. All these things pointing to the character of God, the co perception of the one who is merciful and love. And the angels. The cherubim who are so interested. And he talks about the daily continual service and the yearly annual service on the Day of Atonement. And picking it up at verse 8 of Hebrews 9 here. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holy places was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, which could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So he's pointing to the earthly tabernacle that Moses built at the direction of God where they had gifts and sacrifices of lambs and goats but that service could not make the conscience perfect it wasn't enough to have a co-perception that was perfect with God to cleanse the mind through the fiery trials and the pruning process requires more than the knowledge of the sacrifice of lambs and goats. And that word perfect, teleo in Greek, to make perfect, to perfect, to finish, to fulfill, to consecrate, to make perfect, to complete, to carry through completely, to accomplish, to finish, to bring to an end, to the end that was foresaw the end of the law being the agape love and the pure heart and the unfeigned faith the good conscience to add what is yet wanting in order to render a thing full to be found perfect and to fulfill prophetic scriptures, and uh, very interesting also, again, to consummate, as in to consummate a marriage through the two flesh becoming one, through this holy union of the divine with the human that we saw in Christ that he wants to be our experience through a co-perception that cleanses our mind from sin. This co-perception or joint knowledge, like Adam knew his wife, consummates the marriage, the engagement of 
the holy union with God. The marriage of the lamb. But it can't be done through the animal sacrifices. Back in Hebrews 9, verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ becoming and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified through the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You know, this purge your conscience, that, that's the same idea of having a pure heart that's been purified through fiery trials or pruning, purging. It's purging the mind from everything that's not a co-perception together with God. And it's only through the blood of Christ. And that co-perception will lead us through the moving of God's spirit to offer ourselves without spot to God. To let God take away every thought and feeling that's not in harmony with his perception and to cleanse it by offering up self to God as a sacrifice to God because we're responding to his great love for us because we have the same mind as Christ leading to the Holy Union. And of course, this tabernacle we had an earthly tabernacle and then of course we talk about the heavenly tabernacle that he's he's getting into here. That's in verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament or New Covenant, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of inher eternal inheritance. For where testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. So in order for us to receive the covenant there had, or testament, there had to be a death. That's how you receive the inheritance. Only from the death of the testator, the one who's giving. This is a co-perception with God. We need to see and understand that the death was necessary to deal, to pay the penalty of the transgression of the law of love. And we have to, our minds have to come in harmony with that. Not only to accept that Christ did that for me, but to then accept the reality that I need to do that for Christ. That I need to sacrifice self for Christ just like he sacrificed self for me. Then I'll come into a co-perception in which there is no longer any disharmony. And it's through the blood of the lamb, Christ, Jesus Christ. And a willing death to self. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats and of water and of scarlet wool and of hyssop and sprinkled the people and all in the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. If it was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. 
So the blood of lambs and goats was dealing with the earthly sanctuary. But it wasn't sufficient to purge the conscience, to correct the co-perception, to come into perfect harmony with God. It took the sacrifice of the Son of God himself to make that possible. And now Christ is cleansing or purging or purifying the heavenly sanctuary. But the heavenly sanctuary itself is just a symbol of the temple of our hearts. That's what is actually cleansed and purified by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. To the fiery trial that Christ went through, and then the fiery trials that he leads us through as we have faith in him, lead to the true purifying of our hearts, being made perfect and coming into a perfect co-perception with God of what reality really is and what life really is. Knowing yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then he must have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. In order to get through the judgment, we need a co-perception with Christ of what reality really is. That's what the hour of his judgment is all about. So Christ was once offered to bear sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And continuing in, in chapter 10, for the law having a shadow of th good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins See, the blood and lambs of goats didn't purge the mind from the co-perception of sin from the co-perception of satan's mindset of rebellion it's only the sacrifice of Christ that can purge the mind from the mindset of rebellion and bring us into a perfect co-perception or joint knowledge with God. Into a holy union to a consummation of the marriage. You see, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. See, that's the co-perception that God wants us to have. It's not one of continual sacrifices for sin, but one in which we come into a perfect harmony that leads to us desiring to do his will, O oh God. I come to do thy will, Oh God, that's the co-perception, the conscience, the good conscience that God wants us to have, that we can exercise liberty of conscience. Verse 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. He will make all sin and rebellion and selfishness come under his rightful dominion. That's the co-perception that we ought to have together with God. 
For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified or set apart. See, the perfection comes through the one offering, the offering of the Son of God. Whereof the Holy Ghost is also witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. See, the covenant, the fulfillment of the covenant is the co-perception where God's law of unselfish love is written in the heart through a pure heart of unfeigned love. That comes through the trials and purging process where we willingly choose to follow Christ in a path of self-denial and sacrifice for others. It's a new and living way through the veil of his flesh by the blood of Christ. Very interesting. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And here's the cleansing of the co-perception from the evil conscience that's actually thinking and feeling in harmony with Satan to a correct way of thinking and feeling and perceiving a co-perception, a joint knowledge with Christ. And of course, it tells us here how that leads to judgment. Again, and that the just shall live by faith. Here, live it to, to be lived by faith, we have to have the liberty of conscience to choose to have the mind of Christ, to permit God to give us his perception of reality, and to not resist when he shows us that, and it's a horrifying picture of ourselves. But to trust and believe by faith that he can save to the uttermost. Which is why in chapter 11, then we have the whole list of the great fathers and patriarchs of faith in history and all that they suffered in their experience of God purging by fire their minds to bring them into harmony of a co-perception with the spirit of prophecy. Very interesting in the last verse of chapter 11, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. It's a special work that God is doing with the, the last generation in vindicating his name by bringing a people to prominence who have had their conscience cleansed and have a clear co-perception together with God. Last couple thoughts as we wrap up. It also talks about our conscience in Romans chapter 13 where we have this passage that is often interpreted as a necessity to submit to government authority. But let's see what it's really talking about. We've looked at this before in previous studies, that the word for power here, being subject unto the higher powers, is the word exousia, which is the power to choose. So let's read the passage from that context, verses 1 through 4 here in Romans 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher power to choose. For there is no power to choose but of God, and the power to choose is ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power to choose, resists the ordinances of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. 
Wilt thou not then be afraid of the power to choose? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger uh, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Verse 5, wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. See, in order to have a co-perception or conscience in harmony with God, ye must needs be subject. We cannot have a mindset of we're in charge. We're the one making the decisions. We're God. We're in the right. We can decide for ourselves. No, we 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 got we can't have a mindset of rebellion. We need a mindset of subjection, willing subjection to the one who is righteous in love. And we need to submit to the understanding that God has given us this power. It's a power to choose. And no matter how alluring or overwhelming the power to choose wrong draws us away from God, we actually have power to choose to do right even in those situations where we're being so strongly pulled to do wrong. And we need to submit to that belief as foreign as it is to our experience. Yes, that will lead us to submit to earthly governments when they have just laws and enforce them in a righteous way. But it will lead us to always be in subjection to the government of God in all circumstances the sovereign power to keep our thoughts and our feelings in harmony with the co-perception of Christ. By choosing the right way. That's exosia there. That's the power of choice. The liberty to do the right thing. The ability or strength with which one is endued, which he either possesses or exercises. The, it has the idea of the power of authority, but the authority comes from you are the one that has the right to choose. That's where your authority comes from. When someone is in, in a position of authority in this world, that means that they have the right to make the choice. The power of rule of government. power of judicial decisions, a thing subject to authority or rule, a sign of the husband's authority over his wife. See, this power to choose is a sign that the husband, Christ, our heavenly husband, has authority over us, his wife, the church. And I exercise the power of choice in harmony with the authority of the husband who gave me the power to choose. Now in 1 Peter 2, 19, as we wrap up, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently? But if and when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. A conscience, a co-perception that leads you to a willingness to endure wrong patiently and with grace. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example 
that we should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Total trust and faith because of a harmony of the mind. Walking together because the two are agreed. Here's the perfect example of Christ. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Now, again, in a negative, this, this idea of conscience can have a positive or a negative connotation, a good conscience or an evil conscience. And it describes that evil conscience that we'll face in the last days in the final crisis where liberty of conscience over worship becomes the key issue in the battle. It tells us in 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with an iron, hot iron forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which uh, believe and know the truth. So here we can have a conscience, a co-perception that's seared with a hot iron that creates a permanent scar and impediment. And it's a doctrine of devils. It's the mindset and thinking a co-perception with rebellion, a demonic rebellion, which leads to dishonesty and hypocrisy, a false witness. And we are to beware that this is going to be prevalent and prominent in the last battle. Now it tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 29, Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give not offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. You know, Paul tells us, there's a whole passage here where we could get into more about what you eat and idolatry and so forth, things sacrificed to idols. But the key issue here at the end is that no man is to judge me for the liberty of conscience that I exercise. That judgment, only God can have a correct understanding of my co-perception. Only God sees, is my co-perception perfectly in harmony with him, or is my co-perception uh, uh, divergent and, and at times in harmony with the mindset of rebellion and Satan? And it, no man can judge my conscience. No man can read my mind and know my thoughts and feelings the way God can. All judgment has been given unto the Son. So when it comes to the time of judgment, the hour of his judgment is come. My liberty of conscience isn't an issue that's up for debate for other men in the world to make a decision about. That's God and God alone. It's between me and God how I choose to think and feel and live my life. That's his judgment. He's the one who's going to judge whether what my co-perception really reflects. And yet I should be careful not to so jealously guard my right to liberty of conscience as to unnecessarily put a stumbling block in the way of the conscience of my brother in his exercise of his power to choose and his liberty of conscience. I should never violate my conscience for the sake of someone else's conscience, 
but in every way that I can maintain my co-perception with Christ and yet sacrifice self and deny self for the sake of others, then I ought to do that because that's what God did for us. And this liberty, why should my liberty be judged? Here the word liberty is the word eleutheria in Greek, always translated as only the word liberty. And it is the idea of true liberty is living as we should, not as we please. And it has a chiefly moral sense of freedom to choose. To choose to live as I should, not as I please. That's true. True liberty. Liberty is not doing whatever I want, whenever I want. That's slavery. Slavery to sin and rebellion. True liberty is choosing to do as I should, to live as I should, to live by faith in the one who is faithful and not as is pleasing to myself. That's how I can be set free in Christ with a co-perception in harmony with God. When it comes time to the hour of the judgment. Revelation 14 and the three angels' messages. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every single nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Here, the hour of his judgment, when we're come at an appointed time to come to trial before him, to consummate the marriage we saw, it's the hour when God is judging me. No one else is judging me. And God is judging what is my conscience? What is my co-perception? Are my thoughts and feelings in harmony with him? Or are my thoughts and feelings in harmony with the enemy of all souls? And only God can do that. And the process of him cleansing us in the judgment, under 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Yeah, the mind be cleansed, because we're the sanctuary. We're the, sanct the, the sanctuary that is being cleansed. Our minds and our bodies are being cleansed from the false co-perception, from the false conscience, the evil conscience. That's the judgment, where our judgment comes in harmony with his judgment, because we see and discern things the way he sees and discern things. That's, again, the first angel's message. We discern things the way he discerned things. Then the second angel's message, I see that I'm fallen, I'm fallen. My mindset of rebellion and doing things my own way is fallen. And then the third angel's message, I am given a choice to choose between the two. Now that I can perceive things correctly, now that God has brought me the conviction to see myself the way I really am and to see the better way I can have in Christ, choose. That's the third angel's message, justif justification by faith in the surety, Christ being the surety because he got the victory for us. And then, of course, in Revelation 18, that's where we get the fourth angel who comes down and the whole earth is lightened with his glory. He has great power. The word power here is not dunamos, it's exosia. The angel who comes down, the fourth angel who comes down and joins the three angels as they blend in a, one message. The three messages blend in one and then are given power. That power is the power to choose. Our co-perception 
comes in harmony with God and I realize, wow, I really have power to choose the right, even though I've always chosen the wrong. Even though it doesn't feel right, even though I'm sure I'm so weak I can never do it, I still recognize I can do it in Christ. And I choose the right because it's right. And he gives the power to make it reality that he is glorified in the earth. This is the message of true liberty of conscience, the heart of liberty of conscience, the mindset, the co-perception of correct thinking that no man can come between you and God. No one can take it away. Once God gives you a mind to think like his mind, when our minds are working together and cooperating together, but he's infusing every thought and every fiber of my, all of my, my every neuron in my brain with, with the right perception that comes from him. No one can take that away from me. And then I can choose to worship and obey the one who has redeemed me. Yeah, let's pray. Heavenly Father, the most holy creator God, we thank you so much for your beautiful word, for helping us to, to understand these things, to opening our minds to see all the ways that we have misperceived because our thoughts and our feelings were in harmony with the spirit of rebellion. Please bring us back into harmony with your spirit to give us right thoughts and feelings, to transform our thinking, to give us that co-perception by implanting the mind of Christ in our conscience to purge us and cleanse us through your fiery trials that we might bear much fruit to your glory is our prayer. May it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.